Hello and welcome to a wintry day in Austria as we take on FK Austria Vienna, the pride of Vienna. One of my favorite cities. I once, I've only been to Vienna once, I only spent two days there. I spent one of those days alone, walking around the city, and I just loved it. I, I have never been happier. As you can see right now, we are currently in second place uh, in the Europa, in our Europa League group, there are two games remaining. They're obviously two big games. We need to get a result from one of these two games. So we're starting near our best team. I did put Holdor back in goal because I'm concerned about Rafa's ability to play in the snow. So I think Hodor, he's from Iceland. He should be accustomed to this kind of environment. As you can see there, they've got a strong lineup of names I can't pronounce. I'm in the business of solving your problems. Today I'm going to solve a problem from Prabhav who writes, My problem is that I have severe stage fright. Oh, Prabhav, that is a problem. It is a problem. There's no two ways about it. I So I have some stage fright. Uh, it's not as bad as it used to be. It used to be that I would throw up before almost any time I did anything in public. Like, even if I was speaking... It was, it, in a way, it was worse when the audiences were smaller. Uh, like, I remember, I've done a lot of events, but like a lot of like book signings and readings and stuff in front of audiences that varied in size from like two to eight. Or because if it, if it's if it's one person, you just sign the book and get the heck out of there. If it's zero people, obviously, you don't even have to sign a book. Um, or well, though. That's the wrong phrasing. The correct phrasing is you don't even get to sign a book. <laughs> um, and uh, but but if it's like if if it's two to eight, I never know quite what to do um, because you know it's just uh, it's just uncomfortable and weird. Uh, and so I used to get so so nervous before I would do events, um, and I would often throw up, and then it's just like. That's stressful, too. I didn't dri dribble out of bounds, did I? That's not like me. The throwing up makes it more stressful because then you got to deal with, like, the fact of having thrown up and the fact of feeling like you might throw up again and everything, which, like, compounds the nervousness. And I just... I hated it. I hated it. Um, I really... I really didn't like doing public events of any kind and I have to say while I do enjoy it now and I, I genuinely enjoy it um, I still get really nervous and the the nervousness the the stage fright the anxiety about it is something that I kind of have to overcome in order to do this thing that I know I like doing but now at least I know I like what are you thinking Vinny come on you're so much better than that that was inexcusable so now I can at least tell myself and I think this is important that you have to be able to tell yourself why you want to do the thing that you're trying to do it's John Green it's John Green he's a cutback he's open it's oh, it's off the bar oh John Green you're better than that you're a finisher uh, I don't want to see it again oh off the top of the bar Mr. Managerino, heartbroken, 82 years old. He's very cold. You know, when you're that when you're that old, you just can't get warm when it's snowing outside, no matter how hard you work. That's why you move to Florida, even though it's terrible. No offense to the Floridians. Like, I, I am from Florida. I feel like I'm allowed to say that. Anyway, uh, so I think the first thing that you have to do is you have to tell yourself why you want to do the thing that you... That, that that's going to cause you the stage fright, right? Like, maybe... May, uh, okay, everything worked out better than expected. Hodor was there. Maybe you want to do it because it's required for a class and you want to get a good grade. Maybe you want to do it because you want to work on your fear of public performance or public speaking or whatever. Maybe you want to do it because it's a cool opportunity and you don't want to miss out on cool opportunities because your brain uh, is telling you not to do them. There, there's all kinds of reasons wh th why you might feel that way. Um, we have another corner kick here. That first corner kick I thought was pretty effective, actually. That one was poor. Um, but I think you've got to, for me at least, like it helps to re know why I want to do the thing that I'm scared of or like what I can learn from the thing that I'm scared of or what, like, what, what its potential benefit is to me or to society or whatever. Uh, 
because if I can't do that, then it's just like I hate and deeply resent having to do this, and I don't want to say anything else about it because it doesn't. It's it it merely sucks. What a goal! I mean, out of a out of absolutely nothing, it's it's trots. It's trots. He's trot. Oh oh yes. Oh yes. A little coordinated dancing. Liam trots trotter. They call him L trots. I just made that up, but I like it. And with, I mean, it was really what made that goal. His first touch was impeccable. The finish was nothing special, but what made the goal was the pass combined with the touch, the vision. I would argue, from me, and then secondarily from Ball John Green, Mister Manager Mino, absolutely delighted. It's Trotz's first goal in the Euro League and maybe first goal all season. And what a fantastic finish! Really shows good judgment from the manager, if I may say so myself who started him today over Oreo Baskets because he's a little more offensive minded than Oreo Baskets. A better uh, Oreo Baskets, a better technical footballer, a little more gifted, um, a little uh, a little pacier, but doesn't have doesn't have that urge to get forward in a way that I thought we might need from our central midfield today. And I mean, so far, so good. Now it's just a small matter of keeping a clean sheet, which we haven't done in like six weeks. All right. So that was risky. So once you know why you're doing this, and it could just be like, I'm doing this because I have to. Uh, but like, if you can establish some form, something you might learn from it, some, some way that you're going to try to get, like, have your life be better from it, then you know why you're doing it. Then for me, I need to be prepared enough, but not, and I apologize if my peas are popping, by the way, because I don't have a windscreen. Uh, I just realized that when I said that prepared, like my, the pea popped in my own head. I don't know if you guys know what pee popping peas are, but just don't even, ju just forget I said it. Um, uh, you want to be ready in the sense that you know about what you're going to say and you know how you're going to say it, but you don't want to be too ready in the sense that like you don't want what you say to sound like you've said it 10,000 times before. The first time I ever recorded a radio piece for WBEZ, the um, station in Chicago where I used to make radio commentaries, I was invited to record a radio piece by Amy Krauss Rosenthal, a writer I admired a lot. And I wrote, I wrote this little piece, and she was like, this is great. Can you come in and record it? And I said, yeah. And I got there five hours early, which was a mistake, <laughs> because I spent that five hours like memorizing and rememorizing the piece and then when i actually like performed it on the radio i sounded like i was reading a ransom note because it was so memorized you know that like i i couldn't have any there was no sense of like discovery in my delivery um and and i think that's that's important so you want to be ready but you don't want to be too ready and maybe it can even help you to be like well i'm ready but i don't actually want to get like too prepared uh, because then it then it might get worse. Like, I I don't know. I find that a helpful thing that I that I can tell myself when I'm trying to like calm myself down. When I'm like my brain is telling me like you are completely unprepared for what you are about to do. I always like to tell myself yeah, but it's it's also bad when I am too prepared. So hopefully I'm riding that middle uh, that middle line. Then. Uh, I talk to myself before I go on stage um, and I tell myself that um, I am great. Uh, this is kind of embarrassing, but I'm just going to give you my honest... Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, no. I've made a horrible mistake. I've overrun the ball. Oh, door. Made the save. Well, encourage the guy to miss. Wow, that's a haircut. I mean, no... Every person in FIFA has that haircut and no human being in real life has that haircut. I've literally never seen that haircut on a person. And if I did, I would openly mock them. They look like they're cosplaying a Mustang. Anyway. Oh, that's a good ball to John Green. That's a good ball to John Green. I talk myself up. I tell myself, I'm good at this, even if I'm not. I tell myself, like, you're going to go out there and they're going to be super excited to hear from you. They're going to, this is going to go great. And I, I keep telling myself that at, throughout the preparation process, like when I'm getting ready to go on stage, it's silly and a little bit cringy to say it out loud. But when I tell myself that, it is incredibly helpful. Like I have so much more 
confidence, I guess, when I actually have to go out and do it. Like, I feel like, you know, if I can talk myself up, if I can make myself, even if it's, you know, even though I know that I'm just telling myself this and that it's not real, it's still helpful um, to say, you know, you're good at this. You're, you know what you're talking about. You know what you're going out there to do. You know what you're, you know what, you know what's going to happen tonight and it's going to, it's going to be okay. And you're good on your feet, even though I'm not. And you're, and you can, you can roll with the punches, even though I can't. And so I, I tell myself all that stuff and it does, I don't know, that does help me. I'm embarrassed to say, but it does. And then the last thing I would say, um, is that if you, are in a position where like the, tr- the the tricks and tips of that that people give you for dealing with stage fright. I don't ever look at the audience, you know, all the all the things you typically hear. I don't ever look at anyone's eyes in the audience. I wish I could, um, but I can't. So I look just above their eyes, um, and I like to have the lights as low as possible so that I can ideally not see anyone um you know and and i think you have to find uh, by by doing this stuff you find those tips and tricks that work for you um some people say like oh imagine everybody in the audience is wearing their underwear or something that that doesn't that doesn't help me um but it does help me to say like i you know that i i'm gonna be okay i'm gonna make it through this oh no i'm not i'm not gonna make it through this meredith please don't please don't Okay, it's a corner kick. It's a corner kick. Everything is fine. I just need to defend this corner kick. Defend it. Wasn't great, but I think we got a goal kick out of it. I'm going to make this third suggested substitution and bring on Frankenstein. We've got another corner kick to defend. It's terrifying. So if none of that works and, like, you still have severe stage fright, then you may have, you know, like, a clinical problem. Uh, and I, I felt for a long time, like the only way that I could really deal with my stage fright, what, oh God, that was almost the perfect pass. The only way that I could really deal with my stage fright was through medication. So I took beta blockers, um, before I would go on stage and, um, that kind of worked sort of. Um, and so, yeah, you can talk to your doctor about that if you can't. If you can't find another way, great save there from uh, Hodor. Um, and I don't think it's anything to be embarrassed about or, or anything to feel weird about. Like lots of people have lots of pr- lots of problems and um, deal with them with the help of medication all the time, and uh, it can help a lot. I know I know like professional performers who who who, who do that uh, and find it very helpful and find that it allows them to continue doing the work that they love and that otherwise they they wouldn't be able to do. The only other thing that I'd say on this topic is that you've got to give yourself enough time and space to to be able to... Oh, shoot. Oh, Meredith. Meredith. I... This is a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. We needed... We needed the win. With a win we were going through... And we don't have the win. Playing against the worst team in our group. We've given up an 89th minute goal. We're going all out attacking. And we're just going to try. We're going to try. Nope. Oh, John Green didn't get it there. Did not get it done. We need to swarm the ball. Swarm the ball, friends. There's John Green. Pass. Yes. Go. Go. Go, Gummy. Go, Gummy. Pass it back to John Green. Yes. Pass it to John Green. Turn. Shoot. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Oh, what just happened? What? Who was it? Who? Freeze tag. Who? Uh, I don't even know. I thought it was. I, I only shot because it was John. It was. It was Kaja. 17-year-old Wimbledon Academy product Kaja from outside the box. 51 overall skill level. I don't even know how he got into the game. Did I put him into the game? It, it, he, he, it's a magnificent finish. It's completely perfect. It is, it is without flaw. I, what just happened? We've won the game. I have to go. I have to go ultra. I, I'm parking the bus. Yes, park the bus. By all, we won the game. We won the game with the last kick of the ball. We won the game. And that's how it's going to feel after you're done performing when 
you overcome the stage fright to, to do the work on stage. It's going to feel this good. It's going to feel this magical. The European adventure continues. I think we've just guaranteed ourselves a spot in the knockout rounds. Kaja, one shot, one goal. I mean, he's starting the next game despite that hideous soul patch. Thank you for watching. Best wishes.